Hello and thank you for joining Caterpillar's Safety Culture World Webinar, Developing Quality Leading Indicator Activities. I'm Abby Fansler with Caterpillar Safety Services and I will facilitate today's event. Before we get started, a couple of quick announcements. Number one, the phone lines are muted. Please submit your questions or comments for our presenter through the Q&A or chat areas of WebEx to me and we will use the final 10 to 15 minutes for the Q&A. Also, this event is being recorded. A link to the recording will be posted on safety.cat.com slash webinars later today, along with a PDF version of the slide deck. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to the website and an invitation to complete a brief survey, so please do so um, because your input really does help us improve these monthly events. Now I'm honored to introduce today's presenter, Zach Canoop. Zach is a safety professional with more than 12 years of experience in the field of street and highway construction, construction materials, and mining. As director of corporate safety for a Fortune 500 company, Zach championed a successful safety culture change initiative that included providing management and leadership training, conducting safety perception surveys, guiding continuous improvement teams, and developing accountability systems. For Caterpillar Safety Services, Zach engages with customers to coach leaders, train supervisors, and empower employees to build sustainable safety culture excellence. We are pleased to have Zach present for us today. And without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to Zach. All right. Thank you, Abby. And a uh, very good day to everybody that has called in. Uh, appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to participate in this webinar. Uh, topic is beyond observation, developing quality into leading indicator safety activities. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what the agenda is going to look like for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, we're we're going to look at what makes a difference in safety. Now, if you want to drive safety performance throughout your organization, you know, how do you do this? Uh, I'll show you a path uh, that will lead you to achieve uh, safety excellence. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to look at uh, lagging and leading indicators, kind of uh, provide a level set on what they are, the value of measuring both of them, and also what are some of those pitfalls related to each type of indicator. We're then going to look at uh, quality, uh, how quality plays into leading indicators, how it's really tied to uh, the quality of the safety activities that we do on a daily basis, and we're going to explore what's required to drive and sustain quality within those activities. And then lastly, we're going to talk about some case studies that uh, um, I had the opportunity to work with a couple customers on uh, developing quality into their activities, producing leading indicators to monitor the ongoing success of uh, the activities that they worked on improving. So let me uh, kind of set this slide up here for you. On the left, you can see uh, levels one through six. And then on the right, you can see uh, incident rates that uh, are associated with each one of these levels. And what we have found at Caterpillar Safety Services, you know, working over uh, many years with many different customers, and although this is not statistically valid, just based upon our experiences, that depending on where you are kind of on these levels, one through six, you can kind of factor, you know, or identify where you would be with your incident rates. And so level one, uh, this is kind of the, the very beginning. This is where, as an organization, if you're level one, you are reacting to what is going on. Uh, somebody gets hurt, you have an incident investigation. Uh, you have property damage, someone backs a forklift into a, a shelving unit, we have a work order. It's, it's really relying upon compliance as well. And what we know from compliance is, you know, the rules and regulations, those are really have been developed because of, uh, you know, people getting hurt. Um, and if you look at OSHA regulations or MSHA regulations, they are really driven towards you know, identifying unsafe conditions. Now, we also know that uh, looking at workers' compensation data and the like, that the majority of the incidents that we have are related to at-risk behaviors, probably 90% or more. So with a level one type of philosophy, you're probably focusing 90% of your time on the conditions and 10% on the average behaviors when it should actually be flip-flop. So what we know is that if that's all you're doing, um, your, your incident rates are probably going to be very high. Uh, these are fundamental uh, programs that you have to have in place. 
but you have to move to a higher level of sophistication with your safety processes. And that's kind of moving into level two. That's where we start to uh, get out and, and identify what's going on within our workforce. Uh, that is uh, the creation of observation programs. Now observation programs are uh, it's a good activity, good process, uh, but what we have to be careful is that when we're going out looking at what people are doing, we need to focus not necessarily on what they're doing wrong, but also focus on what they're doing right. Uh, this is also you know, using job hazard analysis, job safety analysis, uh, trying to identify the things that could occur and put a corrective action plan in place so we can uh, minimize or eliminate any hazard to our employees. Near-miss programs, inspection programs, all great processes and fundamental to uh, achieving safety excellence. But if you're just level one, level two, again, you're probably not uh, where you want to be. Level three, that's really it's the most difficult to establish uh, for a lot of organizations. Um, I tend to think of it, although there's no silver bolt in safety, uh, this is, I think, really where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and that's developing accountabilities for the processes within level one and two. Uh, and to be able to demonstrate, you know, visibly demonstrate that commitment, you know, setting clear expectations around the activities, training people on how to meet those expectations, measuring their performance, not just the quantity, but also the quality, uh, which is more important, and lastly, recognizing or reinforcing uh, the behaviors that we desire within those safety processes within level one and two. Level four, this is uh, where we start to target what employees believe. You know, what we know is that on a daily basis, those people closest to the hazards are employees. And we should probably take the time to ask them about what they believe. What is the reality of safety within your organization? And how you can do that is through uh, safety perception surveys, uh, interviews, going out talking to employees, you know, focus groups, whatever it might be. But it's really identifying and getting their voice to figure out what are we doing well, what aren't we doing well, and then moving to level five, engaging those employees in developing, you know, whether it's a new solution or improving an existing process. Uh, it's kind of a continuous improvement uh, theory you know, behind safety, just like in the, the quality movement uh, with a Deming is, you know, looking upstream and using our employees to fix those issues. And it's really about engaging uh, everyone within the organization. Level six, this is basically when you're doing levels one through five really well, you've established uh, those within your organizations, it's, it's ingrained in your culture, uh, then you've achieved level six. And that's where you're approaching zero when you look at the incident rates. Is it hard to do? Absolutely. Is it worth the effort? You bet. Uh, the way I look at level six is when you walk into an organization that's level six, safety smacks you in the face. You know where they stand when it comes to safety. So what I'm going to do is uh, really be focusing on level one and two processes, these foundational um, programs and, and things that we need to be doing. And if we do these well on a day, daily basis, uh, we should really be able to drive the, the safety performance. How we can do that is you know, using the tools from levels three, four, and five. You know, how do we develop accountability? How do we um, go out and, and, and understand the reality of the organization? And how do we engage our employees? So if you're leading indicators are suggesting success, you know, the scores are high, you, you've identified that, um, hey, we're, we're doing all these things right according to what our leading indicators would, would make us believe to, to know. But the lagging indicators are not matching that. So we've got these processes in place, we're measuring them, but we're not making any improvements. If, to me, that would indicate there's probably some deficiencies within those safety processes that are being measured. Um, and as an example, uh, someone shared this story with me. 
they had a, a guy that they recently hired. He's a superintendent, and his job was to go out and install uh, pipe over you know many miles for this project. And and over time, they found that man, this guy's really getting the job done. He was uh, absolutely exceeding any of his peers in the number of you know feet laid per day. Uh, they weren't quite sure how he's doing it, but they were thrilled with the production. The numbers that he was generating, the, the production metrics were off the chart. Uh, what they found out, though, was uh, after the winter season, they had this uh, you know, the freeze-thaw cycle. Uh, come spring, <laughs> numerous places where the pipe was laid, it started to buckle, and the quality that they found was so poor. And so they ended up having to take all this pipe out and replacing it, costing this company a lot of money. Yeah, but based on what the superintendent was being measured on, which was production, he was getting the job done. But when you looked at the quality of the work he was doing, in effect, he wasn't getting the job done. And so when it comes to safety, you know, the same concept applies. We have to really look at the quality of the things that we're doing and ensure that we're doing a job well done. So let's take a look at what lagging and leading indicators are, kind of a, a level set um, so we all have a, a common understanding. We know that we need to have some measurement to tell us whether or not our safety system is working, you know, if the desired results are being achieved. And that's what lagging indi indicators tell us. Uh, it's kind of like looking into the rear, rear view mirror of a vehicle, you know, it's telling us what's behind us. And so, lagging indicators, they're focused on the presence of injuries. Or, you know, it's uh, what has occurred, did people get hurt? It's, it's really a measurement of failure, things that we don't want to have happen. They, uh, they do tell us, however, how well our, uh, the reality is, you know, compared to the upstream uh, leading uh, indicators. And so, they're, they are useful. Some examples of lagging indicators are the traditional uh, injury and illness rates that, uh, whether it's OSHA or MSHA, these are helpful indicators, but you know, by themselves, they do not necessarily indicate how effective or ineffective a safety system is in all, case, in all cases. Now, one example is um, you know, they can be manipulated. Uh, you can have an organization that says, hey, we've gone uh, whatever it might be, one year without a lost time accident. And then as you uh, further dig into it, you find that they've got uh, a lot of people that uh, should be at home uh, but are uh, maybe uh, counting, uh, you know, sorting uh, bolts and things like that, uh, not doing meaningful work just so that we don't have a lost time accident on our record. So easily manipulated. Um, and they're not necessarily meaningful to smaller companies as well. You could have a, an organization that has a really great safety culture doing a lot of great things, and you could have a bee sting, something like that, something that is not very controllable, and your incident rate could be really high just due to the number of man hours you have, and so not a great indicator. And the other part of it is just luck. You, know, you can go a year without a recordable incident and say, you know, we achieved zero, and on the surface it looks really good. but uh, as you look at that organization, you might find that they've had numerous near misses, a lot of close calls that could have been fatalities or serious injury, and it's just a matter of luck that they didn't have that happen. As the organization gets larger, uh, more employees, you've got more history, you can start looking at trends. Obviously, your lagging indicators based on injury and illness rates uh, does become more meaningful. Workers' compensation data. Is another example of uh, lagging indicators. Uh, you can do, you know, uh, workers' compensation cost per hours and things like that. Um, but typically, these will not get the results just by citing these type of numbers. Um, they're not normally that big in most situations, and doesn't really get management's attention. You know, as an example, if you're spending 20 to 30 million dollars on capital, or you're, you're generating revenue in the millions of dollars you have a $500,000 workers' compensation uh, aggregate cost, that might not move management's needle too far, just because it doesn't look like it's uh, a serious number to them. Uh, OSHA, MSHA, you know, DOT citations, 
good, but uh, typically you're reacting, obviously, uh, to those type of things, and we want to be proactive and make sure that we're not getting those citations in the first place. So looking at leading indicators, we, we know that we have to have some valid upstream measurements to, to really tell us is uh, the safety system continuously improving? Is what we're doing working? Uh, and these are the proactive objectives that really drive those downstream results, things that we want at the end of the day. So if the lagging indicators are, if that's looking in the rear, rear view mirror, then the, the leading indicators are really the headlights on the vehicle. They're, they're shining us, uh, they're shining out ahead of us. They uh, allow us to react to what we see, to plan ahead and adjust. So those headlights are the leading indicators. And, and what they're typically you know, focused on is, is the presence of safety rather than the absence of accidents, which is the lagging indicators. It's uh, what are we doing? What are the activities we do on a daily basis or on a weekly basis that are going to get us to zero? It, um, they, they adjust. We can uh, shift emphasis uh, with lagging of the leading indicators. You know, as we look at the leading indicators and we see that, okay, this has become ingrained in our culture. We don't need to focus so much on this. Now let's target this other process. And so we can be very flexible with leading indicators. What are some examples of leading indicators? Uh, you know, percent of on-time completion of safety training, uh, near-miss reporting. You might look at just the the quantity of near misses generated, or you might get a little more sophisticated and start looking at what's the percent of near misses solved per crew, uh, per week, or whatever uh, metric you want to look at there. It's looking at uh, how effective your job hazard analysis or your job safety analysis program is going. Again, you can look at just the, are we generating job hazard analysis? And then you start to look at what percent of our employees are involved in developing them? How many of these have uh, become part of our standard operating procedure. Um, you know, percent of people involved, you can look at number of hazards identified and removed. So there's just a whole host of leading indicators, and you really have to determine which ones are right for your organization, uh, which ones are right for the various activities that you're doing. So we know that we need downstream measurements. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, we look at those and are we having fewer injuries? Are people uh, going home safely? Are our workers' compensation, are our auto liability and general liability costs decreasing? They're important. They're not going away. Uh, we know that because that's what, you know, that's what MSHA measures. That's what OSHA measures. Uh, if you're bidding a job and, and you have to do a pre-qualification, whether it's through ISNET or some other uh, third party, they're going to ask you for that stuff. So we know that they're not going away. So they're not bad. You know, oftentimes they get a, a negative uh, perception that, oh, you know, we can't measure leggy indicators. Well, that's not true. We do, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but we do know that we need to focus on the leading indicators. Now, not all lead, leading indicators are necessarily good either. Uh, you can have an observation program that you've implemented, and you could have collected um, thousands of cards, and, and they could be turned in uh, you know, just as, you know, we've collected 2,000 cards or we've received a certain percentage by division. And if you look at that process and all those cards you collected and you look at your incident rate and it's gone down a tenth, then perhaps that leading indicator or that activity is not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not generating results. And why is that? And that's when you have to start looking at the quality of the activity and to really uh, dig into it. And to, because at the end of the day, these activities should generate, you know, and breed a culture that where people don't get hurt and our leggy indicators uh, show that. So one example I can share uh, in my previous career is we were focused strictly on the lagging indicators. We looked at, uh, obviously, the incident rates. We had all of our casualty insurance costs, where we're at there. And then, you know, we started to say, well, we need to be looking at these leading indicators. And one thing that was common amongst our uh, organization was that all of our supervisors were responsible for conducting toolbox talks. 
And so we developed a leading indicator that was uh, each supervisor has to complete one toolbox talk per week. And we came up with a uh, metric that said, uh, you know, percent toolbox talks completed by division. And from that, we would get uh, the scores back of, you know, here's one division that's at 65% of where they should be. Uh, we've got a division that's uh, over 100% because they were doing more than they were required. And for those that were under a certain threshold, you know, they would get a call. They would be uh, notified that, hey, you're not doing your toolbox talks. And the message there was uh, from division leadership was, hey, get those toolbox talks done. And so quite rapidly, we were starting to see progress where everyone was completing their toolbox talks. Now, what we found was that although they were getting them done, I would say they were producing them in a production-type mentality, the quality oftentimes was lacking in those toolbox talks. And, uh, you know, looking back, I would rather have a division at 50% and doing really good quality toolbox talks or safety meetings than doing 100% of them where the foreman or supervisor on the job slaps the old toolbox talk on the hood of the truck and says, here you go, read it, sign it, and uh, then when you're done, let's go to work. So, lagging indicators are not bad, and not all leading indicators are good. To further kind of demonstrate this, you know, here's an example of what uh, ineffective safety activity would look like. It's also, you can see where the, uh, the leading indicators are not going to drive performance as well. So the desired expectation uh, for this particular activity is for the supervisor to hold a daily safety meeting. Uh, have not established clear expectations around, you know, how to do that, what it should look like, uh, not provide the supervisor with a lot of training on how to accomplish that, and so basically hold the daily safety meeting. So they do that. Uh, their boss goes around and finds out, you know, did you have your safety meeting? Asking the supervisors. And the answer to that is either yes or no. And uh, so for those that did it, obviously, you need to get it done. That's the mid-manager's job. Now, the senior level leadership, they might get a monthly report showing all the departments or supervisors that either did or did not complete their required safety meetings. And oftentimes, senior leadership, under this kind of traditional uh, process, will at the end of it say, well, did anybody get hurt? If the answer is no, well, everything's A-OK. -okay. Keep doing what you're doing. And so obviously that is not a very effective process. Um, there's very little accountability on uh, what that meeting should look like, uh, the, the manager's role and responsibility to ensuring its uh, success, and also senior leadership's engagement in truly understanding uh, what's going on with that particular activity, other than did you do it or not, and do we have any incidents? And so what we're really aiming for when we look at this relationship between leading indicators and uh, lagging indicators is uh, really illustrated well in this slide here. The results that everybody wants in every organization, regardless of what industry you're in and where you're at, is that at the end of the day, you don't want to have fatalities. You don't want to have uh, recordables. You don't want to have people getting hurt. You want to have uh, low uh, workers' compensation costs. Those are the things that we want. Everyone wants that. And obviously, at the, the top level of the organization, that's what they're really focused on. The senior leadership is looking at that. But what we need to do um, is to really establish those upstream activities that are going to drive these downstream results. And it's looking at what are the activities that we can do. And if we do these things well at some frequency, they should lead to those results downstream. And so you look at some of these activities, um, you know, wearing proper PPE, keeping the work area clean, uh, having a hazard identification process, 
making sure that we're training employees on how to operate their uh, equipment or do their job safely, uh, having a good near-miss investigation program in place. And so if you ask yourself, can we control these things? The answer should be yes, absolutely. We can control these types of activities and we can set expectations around these things. And if we do these things well, then obviously we should see the, the results uh, as we embed this into our organization. So the question is, how do we ensure that these activities um, are done in a quality way? What, is, what does well look like? What does good look like? You know, how do we ensure that they'll be successful? I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Dan Peterson. Um, he's a guy that um, for the most of his life, he, he, he dedicated his career to helping organizations achieve safety excellence. He uh, worked with uh, organizations around the world, and uh, he found that regardless of how they manage safety, there's no one right way to do it that those companies that did achieve safety excellence had these six things in common, these six criteria. And at Caterpillar Safety Services, um, what we do, our concepts, our philosophies are really um, founded and based off the work of Dr. Dan Peterson. And so the first thing that, the first criteria that he found all these organizations had, had was that top management was visibly committed. Um, they are actively demonstrating their commitment to uh, their workforce, you know, by showing up uh, the right way for safety, uh, actively participating in various uh, things that were going on, being on the shop floor or out on the job site, and uh, bringing a positive presence to safety. He also identified that middle management has to be actively involved. Well, what does actively involved mean? Well, first of all, it means that management has to be holding their subordinates accountable for safety. If they're not doing that, the uh, frontline supervisors are typically going to do what their boss wants them to do. And if safety is not part of it, then obviously that trickles down to the workforce. So middle management has to be holding their supervisors accountable for safety, and they also have to be participating in some frequency with those activities that are meant to drive uh, the injuries and incidents out of the organization. Frontline supervisors, like the previous slide uh, showed, they, they are going to be held accountable for performance, performance focused around the things that they can control. Supervisors should not be held accountable for the lagging indicators, you know, the injury rates, uh, the workers' compensation costs, but about how well are they doing their safety activities. He also found that employees have to be actively participating. If they're not participating in, in the safety system, uh, eventually what's going to happen is they're going to perceive it as this is, a, uh, this is driven from the top, we have no say in it, and you get to the six criteria, they're definitely not going to perceive it as positive. And safety should be perceived as positive. The fifth one there is about flexibility. You have to have flexibility within uh, the organization to accommodate the various cultures you have, whether you have operations in different states, regions, whatever it might be across the world. There's different cultures. Different cultures require different approaches to how you do certain things. It's not that you can't have a safety meeting or that you, you're not going to do job hazard analysis, but the way in which you do it can be very flexible. So now think about your safety activities. And although I talked about this from a very high level, if you look at the activities that you do, let's say it's a, uh, an inspection process, ask yourself, how is top management visibly committed to our inspection process? How do they show up? What does that look like? How is middle management actively involved? Are they holding their subordinates accountable for the inspections? Are they actually out doing these at some frequency? How is their supervisors focused on this? What training have we provided them? How do we ensure the quality of the inspections they're doing? Do we have employees participating in this inspection process? What does that look like? Have we allowed some flexibility? And at the end of the day, if we do these five things well, obviously it should be perceived positively by the workforce. So 
so in addition to the six criteria, this, these are really the two fundamentals, I would say, uh, philosophies in, in really driving accountability and driving uh, excellence into these activities and also throughout your organization. Uh, Dr. Peterson, he was a, a firm believer that you have to hold people accountable for safety. No different than how you would do it for production, quality, or any other business function within your organization. You know, why should safety be treated any differently? Uh, it's not a bolt-on. It needs to be integrated into the uh, process uh, of how you run a business. And so his approach was this four-step accountability model. And how he defined accountability was the first thing you have to do is define clear expectations around safety. What precisely do we want people to do? Um, so again, pick an activity, whether it's a, you know, a near-miss reporting process, the job hazard analysis, the observation program. What are clear expectations around that? For the employees, for supervisors, for managers, for uh, senior leadership. Everyone should have a clear expectation as to what their role and responsibility is. Second part of that accountability model is we need to train these people on how to do that. And so we've defined what good looks like. Now we're going to train you on how to deliver good. And so however that training needs to be done, we know that uh, best in class is not plug and play or throw a video in. It's uh, hands on. It's using all sorts of different uh, modes of training to ensure that people know exactly how to do this. The third part of the accountability model is to measure that performance. And traditionally, and we'll, this is the bulk of what we want to talk about here in this uh, webinar is about measuring quality. But traditionally, uh, we measure the quantity. Did you do it or not? Yes, no. Um, and we fail to look at the quality. How well did you do it? And, and so it's about building quality standards and, and leading indicators that uh, indicate the quality. And so the last step of the accountability model is to recognize and reinforce what we do well. And so if you've done all the other three parts of this model, at the end of the day, you should be recognizing those people for delivering uh, excellence. And as you recognize and reinforce it, people are more apt to want to do it again because uh, recognition is definitely a much more positive motivator than negative um, recognition. And so it's hard to do, and we could have a whole webinar on just on how to effectively recognize people, but we'll save that for another one. So we look at uh, measurement systems, just kind of a, you know, quickly here, what traditional measurement systems look like versus best in class. Um, you know, if you're managing safety in a traditional way, you're definitely focused more on the numbers. You know, what's our recordable incident rate that we approved compared to last year without really looking at, well, how did we do that? Did we get lucky? Um, what were the things that resulted in this reduction? Or why did we get worse? Um, it's also focused on quantity. So if you are looking at some sort of metrics, you know, we're looking at just, you know, are we doing these things, but not really digging down into how well do we do it. Um, it traditional is typically, it's, it's a lack of control. We're measuring failure. We're not looking at all the successes that we're having and really lifting those up and celebrating those. So you look at best in class, you know, again, back to the accountability model, you know, well-defined, it's, it's communicated, this is what our objectives are. We want to achieve uh, a 1.0 recordable incident rate, and this is how we're going to do it. We have a plan in place. We're going to be measuring that progress, both uh, looking at you know, the quantity, but also really uh, focusing on quality. It's integrated right with production. You know, if you're uh, out in a construction job site and you have your daily production report, that daily production report, all shows should have safety on it. Uh, so we're looking at safe production. And so uh, how many uh, you know, feet or miles of pipe do we lay? What are the safety uh, things that we identified right in that report? So it's integrated in there. Uh, we're looking at activities at all levels of the organization. Uh, safety is not just the supervisor's responsibility or the safety manager's responsibility. Everybody has a role and um, a part in that. And we're measuring success. 
and, and that's much more positive than measuring failure. So here's an example of what quality safety activity looks like. I showed you what uh, kind of a traditional one looks like for a safety meeting. If we build the six criteria into it, we build a, the four steps of accountability into it, here's what it would look like. So the supervisor, again, their uh, desired activity is to conduct a, a daily safety meeting. And uh, prior to that, we've uh, identified uh, what that looks like. What does a good meeting look like? We've uh, trained them on doing that. And as part of that, they are engaging their employees during the safety meetings. They're getting them involved. They're participating. The mid-level manager asks, or on a monthly basis, attends two of these meetings and recognizes the supervisor afterwards on what that person did well or coaches them on how they can improve it. And they'll ask, what issues have you identified? What things are you seeing as a result of these meetings? Which employees are speaking up and really contributing? Senior leader, quarterly they're going to sit in on a safety meeting as well. They have to visibly demonstrate their commitment to this. Uh, at their staff meeting, they're going to ask their managers to talk about what's being done to improve the quality of their supervisors' meetings. And they might ask some questions of their, uh, of uh, the senior leader might ask some questions of the managers, saying, you know, which supervisors are really delivering good meetings, and how do you know? And so now you're starting to drive some accountability from the top down, and in the supervisors see that, oh, this is very important, and obviously when they see that it's important, they're likely to continue to do it in a quality way. So. Some case studies, uh, I worked with a couple of organizations on improving some of their uh, safety activities and, and building uh, quality into it and looking at the leading indicators. Uh, we did this through a uh, rapid improvement workshop where we got uh, frontline employees together. Uh, the organization identified there's an opportunity to improve the daily startup meetings and the other one is the uh, observation or safety contact program. We utilize these employees to really identify what's the current state, uh, what's broke, how do we fix it? Because at the end of the day, we know that the employees, um, they know a lot more about these activities than we would sometimes uh, ex you know, expect. And so they came up with uh, this process that I'm going to share with you. So for the daily startup meetings, the, this team, this continuous improvement team we call it, these are the accountabilities that they came up with. And I'm not going to... Uh, uh, we'll talk about every one of them, but I want to show you how these connect from all levels of the organization. So from an employee standpoint for their daily startup meeting, which has safety and production quality uh, all integrated into that meeting, uh, the employees need to be there on time, they have to actively participate in these meetings, and they have a responsibility to give positive recognition to their peers. If you look at the section managers or what might be a supervisor in, in your organization, their job was to facilitate this startup meeting. And the team said, we want to make sure that we use the word facilitate and not, you know, deliver. Uh, we don't want our supervisors and section managers standing up there and just talking about safety. We want them to facilitate discussion and engage the employees. They also had a, a uh, accountability to get out on a daily basis and interact and observe with each of the work cells or each of the jobs or projects. That way, the next day, they had feedback that the supervisor or section manager could deliver. So again, it was getting them out there with the employees, talking about safety, and seeing what's going on. If we look over to the left, where it says plant manager, it should actually say operations manager. The operations manager had responsibility to participate in one of these startup meetings on a weekly basis in rotating between the different meetings that were going on and provide a minimum of one positive observation at that meeting based upon what they're seeing, um, whatever it might be. But it had to be a positive observation. And then also at the, the meetings that the plant managers have with their section managers, they need to ask some open-ended questions of those section managers. What's, what are you seeing? What are the successes? What types of uh, opportunities are the employees bringing up that we need to be looking at? And so, again, it's driving that importance down uh, throughout the organization. And then at the top level, factory manager, again, you have to participate. You need to be visibly demonstrating your commitment to this. So once a quarter or once a month in this case, they have to attend a meeting. 
and they also have to ask open-ended questions at their meetings as well as to what are you seeing, what's going on, who's delivering good startup meetings. So this team also developed quality standards. So what does a good startup meeting look like? Because if you don't have quality standards, how are you going to know what to measure and whether it's really working or not? And this is a benefit, obviously, for the supervisors and section managers. So they knew kind of what it is that the employees wanted to hear from them. And so you can see that they listed these quality standards. Uh, did the section manager start the meeting with an icebreaker or open-ended question? Was there a review and discussion of the previous day's safety? Uh, was a monthly safety demonstration conducted? So you can see that they've got these quality standards built in. As people went out and sat in on these meetings, they could bring these quality standards with. They could check to see yes or no, are they doing it? And these can become leading indicators that really start to address the quality of the activity. Not did you do the meeting or not, but going beyond that and looking at how well did you do the meeting. And so when individuals are held accountable or measured by their boss for something, you know, they're going to accept that responsibility. They're going to put forth the effort in the area being measured. And if they're recognized and we reinforce them, they're likely to continue to do this and it becomes part of the culture of the organization. So beyond conducting the meetings, here's some of those indicators that I mentioned. It's tracking the attendance from the top floor down to the shop floor. It's looking at those percent of quality standards achieved. Uh, it's also uh, surveying the employees. The, the team that we worked with, they said, we're going to survey uh, quarterly for the first year our employees. And we have a set of questions. They're going to ask about the effectiveness of these startup meetings. And we're going to utilize that feedback to continue to improve that startup meeting. After the first year, we're going to do this twice a year. And we want to see continuous improvement on how these meetings are going. And after we see that, hey, everyone's got the hang of it, we're doing it well, there's no need to serve any longer, then we can stop doing that, we can move on to something else. And so here they're using the survey as a leading indicator tool. Uh, they developed a form that they're uh, pulling metrics out of to also look at the quality standards. So different ways of building leading indicators into the activity. The second one that I want to uh, talk about is uh, a team that I worked with that uh, improved their observation process. They had a peer-to-peer -peer type a program. They uh, wanted to, um, they knew that it was ineffective. Uh, it was becoming a, a check in the box type uh, activity and really not providing any value to anyone. And so they came up with uh, a safety contact program. And you'll see an acronym in here. In here. It's called COBRA. And COBRA stands for Commit to Speaking Up and Listening Up. Uh, O stands for observe safe and unsafe work practices and conditions. The B stands for be positive. The R stands for recognize safe work practices and review safe work procedures. And the A stands for achieve agreement in correcting unsafe conditions and work practices. So it was a really great uh, uh, program that they came up with. If you look at the production employees, their responsibility was to conduct a minimum of two of these uh, safety contacts using the COBRA form per quarter. The section managers, they had to conduct a minimum of two contacts per quarter as well. They had to also include somebody with them, an employee, that, for one of them when they go out and, and to kind of build trust and to work together as a team. If you uh, look at the operations manager, again, they have to participate. They have to review the forms for you know, looking at the quality. And then based on what they're seeing, the operations manager can go back and recognize uh, section managers and the production employees for, you know, lifting up something in particular that's going to help them, uh, uh, you know, take them to a higher level of safety or whatever it is. The plant manager as well, they're out there. They're doing it. They have to do two safety contacts per quarter. They have to include an employee with them. They have to review some of those programs or some of those forms that have been brought to their attention by the operations manager. So you can see that all levels, again, are participating. You've got accountability built into this process. Something like this will definitely lead to success. So again, here's their quality standards. Here's what they're looking at. Was sincere positive recognition given during that safety contact? It's not about spying on people and catching them doing something wrong, waiting for them to mess up. 
and then you know, springing out of the corner and saying, hi, I caught you. It's about talking to them, observing them, and, and saying, here's all the things you're doing right. You know, keep doing these things. Um, you could save someone's life, or you know, what you're doing is, is making the workplace safer. When they do see something that's not right, it's, it's about achieving an agreement between the two people. Well, how do we fix this? How can I help you? And then uh, you know, bringing that to the supervisor. So some of those leading indicators, you know, going beyond, hey, we've completed uh, a 1,000 of these this year. It's looking at how many of the uh, quality standards did we achieve? What rate are we? Did we achieve 90% of the quality standards that we set out? Are we at 60%? If we are, we need to do more training. We need to uh, you know, make a look at how it's being uh, implemented. Uh, how many safety suggestions were provided? How many continuous improvement projects were initiated based on our uh, COBRA form, the safety contact program. And again, this group also chose to utilize a survey to uh, get the feedback from the employees on, you know, how do they perceive it? How is it working? Is it increasing safety awareness? At the end of the day, it should benefit them uh, more so than anybody else. It's kind of a, a closing slide here in developing quality into uh, your leading indicator safety activities. You know, where does it start? Well, you've got to determine, you know, what activities are going to be the best activities for your organization, which ones make sense. Um, and how do you do that? Well, engage your employees is one way. And uh, as you determine which activities you're going to really uh, focus on, you need to determine what does good look like. And so if we're going to if we're going to have a safety meeting, we're going to do job hazard analysis, we're going to do a near miss program, what would good look like? Again, engage the employees and, and ask them what would work well. Once you've done that, uh, establish the me methods of measuring that activity, focusing on quality, not just quantity. Um, you can utilize interviews. Um, whether it's someone within your organization or you utilize someone else to uh, find out from the employees uh, how well a particular activity is working. Um, you can do a survey, um, whether it's your own or uh, Caterpillar Safety Service has one as well. You know, do we have participation at all level with this particular activity? If not, who's not participating? Um, because if you have someone within management or you have top leadership that starts to not participate at the level that they should be, uh, employees and supervisors will notice that and uh, their level of performance will meet the level of expectation that they think is uh, warranted. So uh, we have to make sure everyone's participating. Open-ended questions. That's a great way to uh, identify how well something is working. And you get you got to train people on how to ask good quality open-ended questions. You know, who's doing a really good job uh, providing uh, safety meetings? How do you know that? And let people talk about that. Leading indicators. So, based on these methods of measuring, you can start to uh, build leading indicators to assess the quality standards. As an example, uh, as I've shared already, you know, percent of quality standards met. That's a really good leading indicator to drive quality within these activities. Benefits, at the end of the day, if you do this, you do it well, um, you'll have a lot of opportunities to recognize people uh, from the, the frontline employee all the way on up as to uh, recognizing their success, reinforcing uh, the things that we want them to do. Again, uh, the more we recognize, the more we, we reinforce people, it's going to motivate them to want to continue to do that. Um, it also provides great opportunities for coaching people along the way if people are actively involved at some frequency uh, rather than waiting till the end of the year for performance evaluation or, or something like that. Uh, it definitely drives participation within the organization and, and, and engagement. And uh, the more participation and engagement you have, you're going to get results. Um, it's going to build a healthy climate. It's going to demonstrate that leaders care um, about safety just as much as they care about production and quality. And uh, uh, it's the opportunity to really drive the six criteria for safety excellence, which we know if you do and you do well, um, you can achieve great things within safety. So at the end of the day, um, building quality into those activities, looking at the leading indicators that will continue to drive that performance, uh, 
ultimately you're going to see uh, all of your employees safely go home, uh, everyone, every day. And so I uh, appreciate uh, your time with that, Abby. Uh, if there are any questions, I would be uh, glad to uh, take those on. Yeah, Zach, actually we did get um, some great involvement and a lot of questions throughout your presentation. So um, first up, how do you keep from overwhelming the frontline supervisor with leading indicator activities? <laughs> That's a great question. And, um, you know, I think you, you have to be careful of that. You don't uh, obviously uh, um, put too much on a person's plate at once. But um, I would say that in the supervisor's role, and just like everybody else's, they have a responsibility to manage safety, um, just like they manage production and quality. And if they're out there managing production and quality and asking questions and following up on those type of things, you know, they need to do that for safety as well. And so you have to find a balance, which uh, activities are the right ones that are going to drive results. Um, you want to make it so it's not a, a you know, a paperwork nightmare. Uh, not everything has to be tracked on, on paper and submitted and documented. There are other ways of um, going about that. Um, and so I think you, get, you have to find that balance, and, and you can do that. Okay, the next question is, it's great that we have all the accountabilities and standard work, but how do we keep safety fresh, interesting, and new so that we keep people, more people engaged? This is especially hard in a one-person safety department, quote unquote. How do you keep it fresh? Uh, man, there's a lot of ways of keeping it fresh. Um, you know, the, the interviews, the, the surveys, things like that, getting employee feedback, engaging them, asking them questions, you know, what, what's working, what's not working, how would you improve this? Um, you know, the, the one group that we worked with uh, that did the startup meetings, the startup meeting was the same thing every single day, you know. Anybody get hurt yesterday? No? Nope. Okay, be careful today. Go to work. I mean, that was it. And so they had the opportunity to make it fresh. And one of the things that they did was they said, we want to have once a month a safety demonstration. We want the supervisor to work with someone else or with the safety person to uh, demonstrate lockout takeout on this ma machine or how do we um, properly uh, adjust, you know, uh, a bench grinder, whatever it is. And so they started to provide the feedback on what good would look like and how to keep it fresh. Okay. How do you assign scores to quality measures that are subjective? Uh, well, you... Yes, they are subjective uh, in a sense. Um, you know, if you develop quality standards that, you know, they, they kind of come down to, you know, did the person do this, yes or no? Uh, you know, did they provide positive feedback? Now, the subjective part would be, you know, was it good positive feedback or could it, uh, was there room for improvement there? And so as you have your quality standards, yes, they are subjective, but you can answer those in kind of a yes or no and develop a, a percent score on, you know, are they achieving those targets? Now, as you do that and, and you say, yes, they did it, but there's room for improvement, that's where you can provide some one-on-one -on -one coaching, whether it's with a supervisor or someone else, on how do you continue to improve the manner in which you're achieving those quality standards. Okay, Zach, you may have addressed this uh, after this question came in, and if so, you can just remind us, but do you have examples of measurement tools for activities? Uh, measurement tools, um, like various uh, you know, spreadsheets and things like that, and how you would document those. Uh, is that, I'm kind of guessing maybe that's what the question is uh, directed towards. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, whoever that asked that question, I guess I um, would be willing to um, follow up and share what some of the tools look like um, offline. Sounds good. And it was one of our customers, in fact. Um, one more question for you, Zach. Should safety accountabilities be tied to overall performance and addressed in monthly or annual performance reviews? And a follow-up to that, should this be handled differently for employees at various levels of the organization? The question to the first one is yes. 
you know, why why would you not um, have those accountabilities as part of your uh, evaluation of performance? Because uh, again, why would we treat safety any differently than we do production and quality? So um, that would should be integrated into it. And then again, that shows that safety is is part of equally uh, at the table with uh, all the other things that we do. And what's the second part of the question, Abby? The second part is whether or not that performance, um, the, account the accountability performance should be handled differently for employees at various levels of the organization. So whether or not uh, to handle it differently in the performance reviews. Oh. Um, I, I don't know why it, it would be. I mean, each each uh, level of organization has a different a, a accountability, and if you're measuring those things and you're you're tracking those things, then I don't see why it's, it's held differently. But um, I might need to learn a little bit more about um, what specifically they're asking about that question. Okay, and it looks like we do have time for one more. Uh, what is a reasonable timeline or period to allow before determining if an implemented safety activity is effective? Yeah, that really determines on the activity. Um, so, for example, if you're doing a uh, a startup meeting, that's a daily meeting, um, you can, as you develop your, you know, what good looks like, and you have your quality standards, and you've done your training, and you go out and actually implement it, uh, you might pilot it at a particular uh, part within your organization. And because you're doing a uh, daily startup meeting on a daily basis, uh, you're getting a lot of uh, data and results back on that, uh, and so within a month or two, you have a pretty good understanding of you know where you're at and if you need to adjust um, before you might do full implementation. Now, for a incident investigation process or other activities that rely on certain occurrences, that might take a lot more time to really uh, uh, kind of vet whether it's it's working or not, and so. It, I guess the answer would be it depends on the activity, the frequency of the activity, and so obviously the, the more frequent you do it, uh, the sooner you can probably get a handle around whether it's um, uh, you know, becoming part of the culture of the organization. All right, Zach, um, that was the final question. So I want to thank you and also thank all of our participants for joining the call today. Uh, you will receive an email notification when we've uploaded today's event recording to safety.cat.com slash webinars. That email will also share a link to take our feedback survey. It only takes a couple of minutes to complete, and the feedback is very valuable to us, so please do that. Uh, and then lastly, this was the final webinar in our 2013 series. We hope that you'll join us next year. Uh, our first event is on January 22nd. We'll be doing a webinar on improving a near-miss reporting system. In the meantime, you can find all of this year's webinar recordings at safety.cat.com slash webinars. Thanks again, Zach, and to everyone on the line, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Bye-bye.